effective in destabilizing operations from the CIA, although with the difference that it worked more on friendly governments. The, I, I rather expected that somebody in the audience would take umbrage, uh, uh, deny this slight. Nobody did. Uh, my point, I think, was on the whole accepted. No one doubts that the oil companies conduct a policy in the Middle East that sometimes competes with and on occasion supersedes that of the Department of State. Good many people believe that General Motors had had considerably more to do with setting policy on mass transportation in recent times than the United States government. These, this, these tensions and this exercise of power, these are great and important facts of life. As with inflation and unemployment, this unequal development which I described, inequality, we presently deal with this corporate power uh, by resort to an image of industrial society which holds that it does not exist, can't happen, or which holds that if it does exist, it is an aberration, an accident. This is, this is unconvincing to the average citizen uh, who, unlike uh, an advanced graduate student in economics, is not adequately trained in illusion. Uh, it, it precludes effective diagnosis and it precludes effective remedial action. My case is simply that it would now be safer and wiser, more conservative, as well as intellectually more rewarding to accept the reality. There is power. Let us accept the fact that in this sector of the economy, power is exercised as we accept the other facts of the bimodal system. And then we need to consider whether the exercise of power is, as on occasion it may be, as occasion I believe it is, uh, useful and directed to social ends, or whether uh, it is uh, directed to ends that are not consistent with the purposes of society, in which uh, case it needs to be brought within the parameters uh, that are consistent with the purposes of society. And our social policy then becomes uh, extensively concerned with uh, making that decision uh, and making that decision effective. This, as I say, as I think the uh, point to which we have now come, and I devoutly hope that I have brought you all to that point, too. Thank you very much. I've uh, never received that kind of applause after any lecture I've ever given in a class here at Iowa State, I know, so it speaks uh, pretty much for the audience. Uh, in tradition with uh, our speakers at the uh, uh, on campus here, the, we asked the speakers if they would be willing to answer questions and to dialogue with the audience. Uh, if there, so if there are any uh, points that uh, you'd like to question or you'd like to get some free information from Dr. Galbeth, uh, now's the time to, uh, to do so. And uh, Ken, if, the, if you're willing, if you'll just come up here and field the questions sure. yourself, you can answer them as long as you have until your next obligation begins tonight or until you run into a question that you can't answer and I'll bail you out at that time. Okay, go right ahead. Maybe I'll get you to speak very loud. But you'll have to stand up. I must say this extremely important question, I should repeat it. Uh, something I should have covered in my lecture. There are limits, however, to what you can do in two hours, uh, which that must have seemed. Uh, 
Uh, what about breaking up the big corporations? What about rehabilitating the entrepreneurial half? Uh, this is an established, an old liberal solution. I've long since abandoned it. I think it's inconsistent with the broad current of history. Uh, I think we're uh, for large tasks, which we seem to want done, we're going to continue to want the large corporations. I think we could, they may be larger than they need to be and in more fields than they need to be. But I'm very much afraid that we could spend an enormous amount of energy, for example, in breaking up the oil companies now and have a, only a somewhat more complex oligopoly rather than anything uh, that is very new. That was what happened when the oil standard oil company was broken up. And in any case, we've had the antitrust laws in the books for 18, for ever since 1890. They have an enormously complex legal structure, uh, marvelously remunerative to the lawyers on both sides. Uh, if anything were going to happen along these lines, I'm uneasily of the opinion that it would have happened before now. I also, in a way, think the antitrust laws are a slight menace because they give liberal politicians when they're completely devoid of all other thought, the one great excuse. They can pound themselves in the chest and say, let's enforce the antitrust laws. And sometimes they can even believe themselves they've said something. You in the bright red shirt there, you'll have to stand up. Well, it, this is a very another question which was very much to the point. Could I rephrase it, which I think I uh, might? We, isn't, hasn't growth eased this tension as between labor and management? And won't it become greater again if, for reasons of energy supply or otherwise, growth tapers off? Is that an adequate uh, paraphrase? Uh, there's no question that, in my mind at least, that growth in the past has been a great solvent for social tension. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we've been able to talk so much about sacrifice without ever experiencing any. They, uh, uh, have people uh, compare their position in one year with their position the year before, and if a substantial number find it improved, they don't compare their position with somebody else. And this has been the way in which growth has eased social tension. Uh, and I don't think, incidentally, that we should lose that solvent any sooner than we, we need to. I think I was perhaps one, 20 years ago, one of the first people to uh, raise in a serious and extended way the argument that we needed to balance growth against other social costs, including those to the environment. I remember, John, that one of coming to a very early stage when I was working in the Affluent Society out to Ames to make that argument. And I think I'm safe in saying that such lingering reputation as I have as a Bolshevist goes back to those times when I uh, questioned the sacred uh, goal of maximum growth uh, as a goal in itself. But uh, I also feel that uh, since my instinct is reformist rather than revolutionary, that we need to, pres to preserve this solvent in the system uh, as long as possible. And I think with you that uh, if it, that did not exist, uh, then the clash over who gets the existing revenue, since there will not be any more, uh, will become more acute. And I'm inclined to think that uh, your case uh, which I accept, which I extend by implication, uh, that uh, with declining growth, uh, there could be uh, some uh, some more acerbity in 
in collective bargaining, more competition for who gets what, uh, that this could become sharper, may, may be right. Uh, it could also manifest itself in a still continuing passing on of costs and a more rapid uh, rate of inflation or a more difficult problem in controlling inflation. I rather think it might be that uh, most of all. I say parenthetically, I don't think the I don't think the, the energy supply is going to be decisive for growth for, for, a, for, for some time yet. Oh, yeah. I, huh? <coughs> yeah. I would. Uh, the question is how do you answer the charge that uh, if you intervene in, on prices and on wages, you damage the allocation of resources? Uh, let me note that I only suggest this for the organized sector of the economy. I would not intervene where the market works. In other words, I wouldn't intervene where the market now allocates resources. I would only intervene where resources are now allocated uh, by the power of the corporations and in some measure also by the power of the collective bargaining process. So you're only, sub you're only if you want to put it this way, uh, substituting one form of non-market allocation for uh, another form of non-market allocation. You're only fixing prices, if you wish to put it in the bluntest possible way, that are already fixed. You're only fixing wages that are already fixed. Uh, they, uh, this is a very important point that the uh, uh, friends of the, of the market, the defenders of the free market, uh, uh, out of either innocence or purpose, always assume a way General Motors and General Electric and Exxon and the big corporations which have already taken over the market. And they also assume away unions to a very substantial degree. Um, if, uh, if we had uh, a market economy, I certainly wouldn't be talking uh, about the problems of uh, intervention because, as I indicated in my remarks, they wouldn't ex the, the need for them wouldn't exist. I started, uh, uh, I don't react to the problem of intervention with any great enthusiasm because as uh, John Timmons said, I had, uh, I'm perhaps the last surviving uh, person uh, with uh, a really uh, hair-raising experience with the whole task of running controls. And uh, it was a dangerous thing for something to somebody to undertake in, at a tender age. Uh, I had the feeling that if anybody left your office smiling that you had done a bad job. I've never wanted to see anybody smile since. Uh, permanent damaging effect on one's character. Uh, but. Uh, when after the war was over, uh, reflecting on this experience and writing about it, I uh, laid down a, a, a law which I believe to be valid, which is that it isn't terribly difficult to fix prices that are already fixed. 95%, uh, 90% of the problems of the Office of the Price Administration were in the entrepreneurial sector of the economy, which under the exigencies of war, uh, we had to uh, we had also to fix because we had also to ration. But uh, the problems of uh, dealing with steel prices, chemical prices, those things were infinitely easy as compared with, well, I must say as compared with livestock prices, John. I, I left Washington after the war determined to be a vegetarian for the rest of my life. <laughs> I can tell you it takes only a very few cattlemen in Washington to keep you from feeling lonesome. Uh, Uh, you, and then I'll try to go back deeper into the... Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that whole... 
Oh, I don't think it does, really. The question is, at what point does high taxation become a stimulus to inflation? There's no question that, uh, well, for example, this increase in, in uh, uh, gasoline prices, uh, the increase in the OPEC prices, adds uh, to the price increase. But the problem of inflation is always a process, uh, and uh, uh, one thing building on another. And one should uh, not confuse something like the wage price spiral, which has its uh, has its persistent and continuing effect with the one-time effects of, say, a tax increase. And, of course, the uh, effect of a tax increase on demand, tax, tax increase if it reduces the deficit, if it re reduces the total of aggregate spending, uh, can, in fact, uh, be deflationary. Now I must go to the back of the room. Is anybody at the back that I, uh, I want to encourage everybody coming to lectures to come down to the front row here, yes. I oh, better stand up. Uh, soybeans. <laughs> you see a danger emerging for, I missed a word or two there. Tor Well, I, the question is, is there a dangerous attitude or a, an erroneous attitude in, on the part of the public in equating uh, economic success with the supply of energy? Is that a fair statement? Uh, I, I think, we're, I, I think this, that we, we have got the consequences, I think the administration has got the consequences of the energy program out of, uh, somewhat out of focus. Uh, the, 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 uh, to, to talk about the measures that have been taken uh, in quite the catastrophic terms uh, that has been done, I think, is unwise. To talk about the uh, moral equivalent of war and then have a small increase in taxation is, seems to me going uh, is a little bit uh, unwise. The, uh, and I would, uh, I would think that we could it's my, my own feeling that we could indeed, as uh, you imply, accommodate to a uh, much more conservative policy in the use of energy, substantial shift to uh, energy forms other than oil. This is not an energy crisis, really an oil crisis, uh, with uh, n not any vast economic consequences, and, uh, and should. On the other hand, uh, one can understand how, <coughs> how President Carter wanted to, you know, make the issue as dramatic as possible. Uh, the only problem with this is that when something really important comes along, it will be hard to make it much more dramatic. Well, I'm not saying this is unimportant, but the next time uh, it will be hard to whip up the same excitement. Now, uh, John, I'm going to take about two or three more questions. I, I often explain to audiences what the theory of question time is. It's, it's <clears throat> not to answer all questions. One can't do that. It's to give a slightly fraudulent aspect of democracy to a, an otherwise authoritarian proceedings. And uh, you, so I will, uh, uh, and you, you begin to taper off when you see the anxious look of people who uh, who are dashing out, trying to desperately also to look as though they were leaving reluctantly. Uh, so, you.
Well, no, I don't. Uh, the question is, do you think they, wouldn't it be simpler just to have it all uh, taken over by the large corporations? Uh, and isn't that the way in which the problem will be solved? That's a fair paraphrase. I don't really think this will happen. I don't think it's a danger. I think there is some equilibrium here between large and small. There's a very large range of industries that do not lend themselves to, uh, they lend themselves to much larger scale operations than we used to imagine. That's true of agriculture. They still don't lend themselves to, the, uh, to mass aggregation. Uh, I think it's fair to say, John, that except for sugar and a few other things, that the large-scale corporate penetration of agriculture has been, on the whole, a, a, a not very successful. A corporation develops in agriculture, as we were talking earlier, but the uh, General Motors doesn't move in on agriculture. So this, there is a large number of service enterprises that have, still, that have to be done uh, under the whiplash of the individual's own uh, response to profit and loss. There's an area of the economy, which I mentioned in my comments, to which I really think we need to give much more attention. Uh, the whole artistic industry uh, is part of the mythology of scientists and engineers that they're the last frontier. Actually, when pe things begin to work, people want good design, want good appearance, want something that's pleasant to live with. It's much the further and much more important frontier is that of the artist and designer. And this is something which does not lend itself to large-scale organization. The artist very rarely fits into a big organization. If he does, there's a tension. Uh, they, uh, I re remember when I was working, first working on these new ideas, I had a substantial amount of help, for which I was very grateful, I am very grateful, from the DuPont Corporation, uh, the epitome of the technostructure in some ways. I remember a DuPont executive commenting on this. DuPont is a we think of it as a chemical firm. It's really a very big textile firm, big manufacturer of synthetic textiles. And it uh, is a very large employer of designers, of artists. He was telling, saying, you know, we can employ chemists and chemical engineers and economists and statisticians and computer programmers and all those people, and we know we can tell the good ones from the bad ones, and there's no problem there. But he said, we really run into trouble when we get to artists, uh, designers. We can't tell the good ones from the, ba from the bad ones, and they won't live in Wilmington. And, um, uh, they, uh, so they, they are fo they're forced to farm this out to small enterprises in New York, Paris, wherever. Uh, so I don't think that the uh, technical possibilities of uh, the takeover by the big corporation does exist. I think the, we may not have found the uh, equilibrium yet, but I think there is an equilibrium situation is between them. Now, my, yes, I'll come to you. The question is, with the rise in inflation, why is the stock market so stagnant? Actually, it's been falling, hasn't it? Uh, oh, I suppose it's, it's the fear that uh, with inflation continuing and in some degree gaining momentum, uh, that interest rates will go up and that uh, uh, this, will, uh, this will have its effect on the usual effect on capital values. Uh, but you can never really tell. Wall Street uh, has deep elements of irrationality. Uh, combined with, no one should ever doubt, uh, substantial small elements of insanity. Uh, so that uh, they talk to each other and uh, worry each other and the uh, uh, mythology spreads so that one cannot assume rationality to uh, in any given movement of the stock market. But I suspect that the fear of rising interest rates <coughs> has, a, uh, has a substantial effect on this. Now I take one more and uh, See if there's any part of the audience I haven't looked at. No, I'll pass over you. I'll go back to you at the very back with the. Uh, 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 no, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
No, I, I'm sorry, you'll have to go slower and louder. That's right, yeah. Now, I, I think what this is a very, I think this is a very good question. There are really two questions here. How would you, what, what is the nature of this regulatory process? And uh, I'll come to the other one in a moment. I, I don't think you distinguish this between corporations. I think what you one does is establish the parameters within which, uh, which, which reflect public policy, uh, which reflect the public purpose. And one should always test, it seems to me, any proposal that one makes to find out whether, in fact, it isn't in some degree being done. Well, after all, on the environment, on safety and health, uh, on the, uh, the treatment of employees, on the treatment of the consumer, we are already erecting a very substantial structure which defines, uh, specifies uh, the limits of law uh, within which the corporation functions. And much of this is directed, we should remind ourselves, at the large enterprise. So that uh, the process that I am describing of defining the public interest and specifying the parameters uh, within which then the firm operates is one which is not novel. It's one that's well advanced. And this is one of the reasons I must say why I feel that that's a much more constructive mood than the, uh, than the purely theoretical enterprise of breaking them up, which isn't going to be done anyway. Your, your other question uh, is perhaps the most difficult one that anybody could ask. If you are depicting a system in which the, uh, this sector of the economy has great public power, including great public power in relation to the state, then how can you turn around and ask the state to regulate it? Uh, isn't there a contradiction there? I'm putting your question in somewhat stronger form, but I think that's the thrust of it. And there is no question, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a major contradiction here. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a vital uh, contradiction in this, uh, in this remedy. The only answer I have is that as one perceives the contradiction, uh, then in some degree it disappears because uh, people perceive the difference uh, between uh, the their interest uh, in the exercise of power and the surrender to the uh, corporation, that it in some ways the power of the great corporation depends on the concealing of this conflict. When we have what I want to call the public perception, uh, that acts as an antidote or a counter to the uh, power of the corporation because its exercise then uh, is seen as something that in to, where there has to be uh, an exercise of public intervention, an enter ex exercise of public power. Um, they, uh, and we have seen also, again, testing against, against the reality, but on a great many matters, uh, the steps that have been taken to arrest industrial pollution, the steps that have been taken to uh, improve highway safety, the question that steps that, have, uh, that are, have the agitation that has been built up, for example, on such a matter as uh, overseas weapons sales, overseas bribery, so that the public perception can be uh, developed to the point where it establishes uh, these parameters. So I don't feel uh, wholly pessimistic about it, but I wouldn't in all honesty want to deny the existence of the conflict which you identify. On that semi-optimistic note, uh, 
I presume, John, we should adjourn. Dr. Galbraith, on behalf of the students and faculty in the University Lecture Committee, uh, we certainly appreciate your sharing your wisdom, your humor, and your information with us this evening. And uh, we want you to know that you're always welcome here at Iowa State University. And if you don't come back in a respectful period of time, why we'll uh, bring you back through the uh, lecture series. And in the meantime, we'll be watching for you on TV. Thank you. <laughs>